The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now the next day, John was standing uh, with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him, and sa- and heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? They said. Jesus replied, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. When I was a kid, I had a job. I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I would mow lawns. My dad gave me a gas can and a lawnmower, and he says, go make some money. And I walked door to door asking neighbors if I could mow their lawn, and they were very lovely and nice and let me do it. And I'm sure it was perfect. Um, But I took tapes with me and my little tape deck and my earphones so I could listen to music as I was mowing lawns. And I didn't have an extensive tape collection, but I had one tape that I'd love to listen to, and it was a tape of U2, and on it was the song 40. And as I was mowing the lawn, I would be mowing, and all of a sudden that song, it was on the B side, the song would come on, and I would stop and turn the mower off and rewind the tape and press play again to keep mowing, and then when it would end, I would stop, and I would rewind the tape, and then I finally made a mixtape. You remember those? Right? Yeah. I made a mixtape, and I, had, I, I put it like four times in a row, so that way I didn't have to stop when I was mowing. I loved that song. I thought it was just fantastic. If you've never heard it, go listen to it. I think it's on the War album on the B-side, U2's 40. So weeks later, I'm at church, and I'm not really paying attention, as a kid would do at age 12 or 13. Look at the back row. And um, so uh, all of a sudden, somebody's reading lessons, and they start reading Psalm 40. And I'm like, oh, can you believe it? Oh, my gosh, they stole Bono's song. <laughs> and then I have what Pastor Heather explained last week was an aha moment, an epiphany, when I realized oh, they wrote a song based on the Bible. How cool is that? I was so excited to learn that. A song took on more meaning for me. So let's read Psalm 40. Take out your Bibles and turn to page 446. This is the psalm that's appointed for today in our gospel, uh, in, our, in our worship service. And I asked Shelby, it's not included in the, in the lessons, so we could actually read it back and forth. It's Psalm 40, and we're going to do this old school responsorily by half verse. So if you don't know what that means, here's how it works. This side of the congregation is going to read the first line, and this side of the congregation is going to read the indented line. So that's half the verse. So one at the beginning, the second half of one over here. Makes sense? Page 440, Psalm 40, just the first three verses. Let me hear it from this side as we begin. I waited patiently for the Lord. Over here. He inclined and heard.
This is a powerful song. It's a great song too, but this is a powerful song about being delivered. That somebody is stuck in an old way of thinking, an old way of doing things. They're stuck. Their feet are like attached to the ground, sunken in the clay, in the mud, in the muck, in the mire, and they are lifted up out of it. You can almost see the mud and the clay kind of dripping off their feet, and they're placed on a secure footing, something that is very foundational, where they feel very secure, and a song is placed in their heart. And it is so magnificent that when they sing it, others find God and put their trust in the Lord. It's a very powerful song. And it became influential in even how I became a pastor. When I was in college, um, I I was really worried about what I was going to do with my life. It was was close to graduation. And um, I uh, had been a youth minister a couple of times over summers and thought, I don't know if I'm really prepared for ministry or not. I don't know if I want to do that. Plus, I was failing theology. So (laughs) it didn't really make sense. But I was failing it so bad that uh, my professor, Norm Beck, God love him. Uh, If he ever watches this, he'll he'll giggle, I hope. But um, he's still teaching there. And um, he was so gracious because he said, Steve, you're failing. Your final was terrible. Retake it. He gave me every single test I took and said, go and do this again. Take your Bible, take your notes, take your friend's notes, and go go take this again. I was so thankful that I got to do that. So there I am at Texas Lutheran. I'm sitting outside the chapel, which happens to be named the Chapel of the Abiding Presence. Sound familiar? And I'm underneath this tree, and I have all my books laid out in front of me, and I'm studying, and I'm just so worried because if I fail, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to come back. Oh, my gosh, I need a job. What am I going what, what to do? I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, the wind starts blowing, and my Bible pages start flipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I slam my hand down to stop it, and my finger is on Psalm 40. And I just start crying because I know I'm supposed to be in a church. I'm supposed to do ministry. I don't know how not going to be a pastor, but I'm going to do ministry in a church somehow, some way. A week later, I'm walking through the hallways of the music building, and there's an ad of a church that needs a choir director, and I apply, and I got the job, but they also needed a youth minister, so they hired me on the spot for both things, and I started my career in a church. Now, at that same church, years later, um, one of the pastors tricked me, Mm. and if Judy Miller's watching, it's you. Um, she tricked me and took me to a seminar at Texas Lutheran. And I thought we were going for another reason, but the seminar was, so you think you want to be a pastor? (laughs) Yeah. And I met with seminarians and I met with professors and I met with pastors and I left there with a new song in my heart, the song of praise. And now I get to share the word of God with others. That's, that's part of my call story. There's more to it. I share this with you today because last week, Pastor Heather shared her call story, and I'm sure there's more to hers as well. Um, And if you missed it, it's a great sermon. Look it up on YouTube. It's a really great sermon about aha moments, epiphanies. Um, So check it out. But the call story is important. We all have them. And in Scripture today, we hear three different call stories, which is why I wanted to share ours with mine with you. If you look at Isaiah, God is calling Israel and Jacob Not only to return to their homeland one day, but that God has been calling them since before they were born. God knew them in the womb, that God has been faithful to them even in the middle of all of their struggles and all the devastation and the exile and having to be planted in a whole new place. But more so, this call is for them to be a faithful servant that's going to give light and salvation to the whole world. What a call is given to these people. Paul is writing to the people of Corinth today. And the people of Corinth are are having a hard time. They're only seeking their own will. They're only looking for their own way. They're only looking out for themselves. They're suing each other. They're not allowing to eat with each other. There's all kinds of complications happening. And Paul is calling them to return to this baptismal call, to return to what God has asked of them. And at the center of 1 Corinthians is chapter 13, the love chapter. We have all had it at our weddings, right? The love chapter. But it's not about romantic love. It's not about brotherly love. It's about God's love, agape love, sacrificial love. And that's at the center of everything they're supposed to do. So Paul's calling them to return to fellowship, to return to community, to come back together. 
and to embrace God's love when we do so. Let everything you do be done out of love. In our gospel today, Jesus calls his first disciples. John the Baptist sees Jesus and said, there he is. That's the Lamb of God. And, and some of his disciples start to follow Jesus. And they walk up behind him, and Jesus turns around and says, what are you looking for? And they, <coughs> and they reply, where are you staying? So Jesus says, come and see. Now, this little interchange is pretty important. That word staying has a lot of different meanings. It could mean enduring. It could mean living. But in the context of today's lesson, it means abiding. Sound familiar? <laughs> abiding. So in other words, Jesus is saying, come and see. Come and see where and in whom I abide. Later on in the gospel, Jesus will remind them that I abide in you. You abide in me as the Father abides in me. He even goes on to say, the Holy Spirit abides in you, and you will go on to do greater works than these. Jesus is looking at his disciples, calling them to say, come and see the abiding presence of God. So this begs the question, what is God calling us to? What is God calling abiding presence to be and to do? Over the past few months, we've had listening sessions. We've had a group of people, a listening team, that interviewed the staff, and they interviewed the council, and they interviewed leaders. And then we all got together as a congregation and had listening sessions where we got to share what we think is God is calling us to be and to do in the world. And right now, that report is available for you. Look in your Friday email. If you didn't get it, come see me afterwards. We'll print one out for you. But what is the call that's being placed on the heart of abiding presence? Maybe God's calling us to be like Isaiah, to be that light, to, br to be the servant that brings light and salvation to all people, because we're already doing that in a lot of really neat ways. Like today, we're going to haven for hope. And we're bringing coffee and cookies in the courtyard, giving a little bit of home to people that are longing for one. We build ramps for people that are in homes that want to be able to leave and go out into the world and share in God's grace and glory. We're also going to be tomorrow marching with others for justice and peace in all the world. That's part of our baptismal call. But what else? But Jesus says, come and see. Abide in me. Maybe God's calling us to be like the people of Corinth, to do everything that we can as a response of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And we already do this in a lot of really neat ways too as well. We proclaim all are welcome, and I truly believe that we mean it, all are welcome, to, and we extend God's love to every single person that walks through these doors. We do it at the font, we do it at the table, we do it at the pulpit, we do it in the pews, and we do it as we walk out of these doors. We have Stephen ministers that lovingly walk with people that are learning to live life in new ways. And we have events that are made so we can come together to share the love of God in Christ Jesus with our fellowship events like Reformation Festival and, and annual picnics. But we also do that with concerts and Bible studies and worship experiences. But what else? Jesus is saying, come and see, abide in me. So as we discern the call that's being placed on the heart of abiding presence, I know that we can trust that this call is one where we will take light and salvation out to the whole world, that this call is one that's going to share the love of God with every single person that we come in contact with, that this call welcomes all to this place of God's amazing grace. It's a new song. A new song is being placed on our hearts right now. And as we sing it, others will learn to, to love and trust God. Come and see. We are the abiding presence of God in the world. Amen.